to the stages for allowing me to, uh, to present. Uh, gastric bypass induced hyperinsulinemic hypoglycemia. It's, uh, it's a uh, ostensibly uh, long title for something that I think is uh, adequately confusing, and hopefully I won't confuse you too much uh, in, the course of, in the course of this talk. Let me go forward. Oh, here we go. Is that it? Oh, okay. Great, thank you. When we talk about symptoms following gastric bypass, we're all classically honing in on dumping syndrome. And we all understand any problems related to nutritional supplementation and following the gastric bypass to related to such. Dumping syndrome is a well-characterized phenomenon after any gastrointestinal reconstruction. It doesn't have to be a gastric bypass. It can follow vagotomy. It can follow pyloroplasty. And really has a number of significant components. Two principally are its vasomotor and endocrine components. And generally, after a gastric bypass for weight loss, it's seen as a beneficial uh, beneficial outcome. That is to say, people will think twice before consuming something sweet. Dumping syndrome has, in principle, two phases. An early phase. The early phase is what we understand the best. It's the accelerated gastric emptying of very concentrated materials into the GI tract. There may or may not be a change in blood volume as a result of this. That's still controversial. Uh, there may be vasodilation as a result of this, and it seems to be mediated by a number of peptides, principally VIP, PYY, neurotensin, GLP-1, which you've heard a great deal about this morning, and GIP also, which are known as the incretin hormones. Late dumping syndrome usually occurs after a few hours and is associated with hypoglycemia. Now, it's okay to have hypoglycemia insofar as you don't know it and you're not a type 1 diabetic. In other words, you don't want to have low blood glucose and be unaware. But most people that do not have type 1 diabetes, having a low blood glucose is of little consequence unless you have significant symptoms. And I'll talk about that in a minute. But it's important that you that you relate your symptoms to your glucose. And earlier we saw uh, the introduction of the term Whipple's triad. Whipple's triad was originally a term used by surgeons to determine if someone had an insulinoma, for example, uh, something that needed to be resected. Now it's a way of identifying reactivity and relationship to glucose. And it's essentially what you're looking at is the symptoms that the patient displays, are they related to hypoglycemia? palpitations, etc. Do you document with those symptoms a low glucose? And most importantly, when these patients get sugar in some form, will that correct the signs and symptoms of hypoglycemia? This is critical to understanding and practicing this as you move forward in understanding this disease entity. It's also important to understand what I talked about earlier is just because you have a low blood glucose doesn't mean you have symptoms related to that. And this is a study actually from, it's been demonstrated many times, this is from Lev Ram many years ago, uh, in uh, looking at patients that have had an oral glucose tolerance test, not gastric bypass patients or people after GI surgery, just having a glucose tolerance test. And 10% of patients after this have a nadir glucose that's less than 50. And a number of people, uh, and a, several more, will have an, a level that's less than 45. The point being, oral glucose tolerance tests and low glucose in the absence of symptoms don't mean anything. And you should not treat it unless someone has a type 1 diabetes scenario and they may be unaware of their hypoglycemia. Very important to keep stressing that. Now, the syndrome that we're talking about today is characterized by a number of important observations. They are that post-gastric bypass hyperinsulinemic hypoglycemia occurs rarely. It appears to occur extensively in non-diabetics, and its prevalence is unknown. 
What's critical about this, and I think the slide may have gone by, is that we're also interested in the constellation of symptoms that include neuroglycopenia. Dizziness, loss of consciousness, blurred vision, actually passing out. Those are the symptoms that we're actually talking about, not sweating or palpitations necessarily. These are the symptoms that we're most concerned about that constitute neuroglycopenia. These are generally, as we've always known, responsive to a low-carbohydrate dietary intervention. And we looked back at our last 3,000 or so ruin y gastric bypasses, we found the incidence of this to be remarkably low in people that present to us. Probably between 0.2 and 0.4 percent of patients will have neuroglycopenia following gastric bypass. What do you need to do to make the diagnosis? Well, typically, this occurs in patients that have a duration of surgery beyond one year. They have spontaneous correction of their hypoglycemia. That is to say, as opposed to an insulinoma, they don't go on to die from this. This will correct on its own. That's paramount in the diagnosis. In the fasting state, and this is not a fasting disease, very important, they have a normal fasting insulin, a normal fasting glucose. And in the setting of hyperinsulinemia, postprandially, we'll talk about that, you see a lowered glucose down to about 50, and in some cases, 55 milligrams per deciliter. Where are we today in terms of management of this? Well, the management is essentially the same as management of dumping syndrome. It's avoidance. You start with low-carbohydrate diet, and you want to look for improvement. If someone cannot stick to that diet, and they have symptoms, then you may want to introduce other therapies. That's different from being on the diet and still having symptoms. You may want to start um, a carbose, which is an alpha-glucosidase inhibitor, which basically competitively blocks the enzyme which breaks down carbohydrates. The problem with this is that eventually the carbohydrates do get absorbed more distally in the gut, and also people get significant GI symptomatology with this. You can look at reduction of carbohydrate absorption with the acarbose. You can also look at reduction in insulin secretion. If someone has severe symptoms, octreotide, for example, uh, somatostatin, 50 milligrams before each meal twice a day, about 30 minutes before each meal. Or you can look at something called pramletide. That's a form of amylin, which is co-secreted naturally with insulin. And when given uh, parenterally, uh, subcutaneously, patients can then have reduction in insulin secretion and also impaired gastric emptying. And that's what you're trying to do with the somatostatin and the amylin is reduce gastric emptying. Calcium channel blockers, a few case reports of that. At the end of the day, the outcomes of these therapies, medication management, is very, very variable. And really, it's difficult to hang your head on this therapy. And so we need to look at what are other causes that may contribute to this. Now, whenever you assess someone for hypoglycemia, you want to look at other types of things that are going on. So if you're really working someone up de novo, you want to make sure that they don't have problems such as cortisol deficiency. You want to make sure the adrenal is working. Alcohol, particularly in someone who's had a gastric bypass. If they are a drinker, and we know about addictive problems in post-gastric bypass in a small percentage of people, they can demonstrate very significant hypoglycemia about 24 hours after a major drinking episode, nothing to do uh, with hyperinsulinism. You want to make sure that they don't have insulin antibodies. You want to make sure they're not any, uh, taking any sulfonylureas. And you actually can do a screen for sulfonylureas to make sure they're not taking these medications. But at the end of the day, you want to exclude insulinomas, which is almost invariably a fasting disease. Non-insulinoma, uh, pancre pancreatogenous hypoglycemia that I'm going to talk about, and nicidioblastosis. At the end of the day, those are the takeaway messages from, from the lecture. So is this a fasting disease or not? If it's fasting, you want to make sure that they're not drinking and you want to make sure they're not a high, they don't have an insulinoma. And the best way, if you cannot find a, another etiology to demonstrate that it's fasting, is someone fa have someone fast. And you do that with a 72-hour fast. And by the first 48 hours, everybody that's pretty much have an insulinoma will declare themselves. And so that's off the table.
And then the next question is, what do your patients have? There's a very interesting clinical disorder. I never saw one as a resident, but the pediatric surgeons see this. It's called nysidioblastosis. And we see this in children, especially when they're admitted to the NICU, and they'll present with hypoglycemia on a blood test, which is routine. It's characterized by budding of islet cells from the pancreatic duct epithelium. You see increase in the size and the shape and the number of islet cells, and also islet cells, and islet cells are not supposed to be along the pancreatic duct, islet cells that now reside along the pancreatic duct. This is the infantile or pediatric disease, the neonatal disease. This disease causes fasting hypoglycemia. These kids are hypoglycemic at, at birth. A group at the Mayo Clinic, Dr. Service and colleagues in 1999 reported nysidioblastosis in adults. There's some important things to understand. One, it's in adults. Number two, it was a male prominent disease. And number three, this was a disease not associated with fasting. So as we're, as we're calling it nasidioblastosis, it's very different in terms of its presentation. Also, in the children, you see positivity of a number of genes that we don't see in the adults. This was uh, seen in a number of different patients. And in order to treat them, because these patients don't have insulinoma, they did image-guided image guided injections of calcium and measured the right hepatic vein insulin secretion. And if they saw a step up in this, the pancreas was indeed removed on these patients, selectively, partially. A few years later, six years later, they identified the same syndrome with a female predominance uh, in, in post-gastric bypass patients. And these were patients that had very significant hypoglycemia, two to three years, hours after a meal, who are about two to three years, years out from, from surgery. And what this slide shows, if you look at the, the imaging, nor, here's an obese islet, here's an islet cell cluster in someone that's had uh, the symptom, they're much larger in number, and also you see islet cells staining the side of the ducts. Very abnormal, per the authors. And recommended, based on the observations with the previously diagnosed nasidioblastosis, that the pancreas be removed. And so partial pancreatectomy now enters the scene, very invasive therapy for potentially an important disease if someone's passing out. Now, this is going to be presented at an upcoming endocrine meeting. I found this online, so I figured it was OK, uh, showing that in the 75 patients that had partial pancreatectomies, 87% of people reported recurrence of symptoms. This is from Jeffrey Thompson and his group at the Mayo Clinic. So taking out the pancreas may improve quality of life, as the slide indicates, but does not get rid of the symptomatology. And that's very important in understanding what we're dealing with here. And indeed, the slides from those original patients that had nasidioblastis were reviewed and compared to autopsy patients, and they found no difference in micro islets around the ducts, uh, no difference in the number of micro islets, and no difference in the incidence of insulin positive cells. So, this hypoglyce, this nysidioblastosis may not actually exist as a clinical entity. It's still highly controversial. Important to talk about that. And so, this begs the question is this something that can be controlled by diet? And we looked at a number of patients in Minnesota. 12 patients, and we did something that's very different. Rather than give them a meal to see if they developed it, we gave them a high-carbohydrate meal and a low-carbohydrate meal. And we looked at our patients, and very interestingly, note the absence of diabetes in these patients. None of the patients that developed this, except one now that we found, and she had very mild diabetes, had significant type 2 diabetes. They all had the form frust of the neuroglycopenia, as you can see here. And if you can see here, look, loss of consciousness, loss of consciousness, palpitations, dizziness, headaches, significant in our patients. I'm sorry that the scale doesn't come up on this, but basically this is the glucose and insulin. Very low insulin and a very steady glucose with a low carbohydrate meal. So we do a low carbohydrate meal first, and then we follow it with a high carbohydrate meal. So this is sausage, an egg, and coffee or tea without milk. And this is a meal that's with juice and uh, uh, yogurt that's fat-free. 
And what we see in these patients uh, that developed it, a very low nadir glucose of 44, an insulin peak of 200, but look at one patient, and insulin goes, goes up to 500. Concluding comments, please. Sure. Last three slides, if I may. Um, in dietary management, 83% of people got better. That's the takeaway point. And the rest improved significantly in that model with, by taking um, acarbose and other medications. What's the cause of it? Last slide, I want to show you something very interesting. Here's a paper that was just published uh, in, from the Stanford group uh, with one of the, the endocrinologists from, from Denmark showing that if you give glucose a meal transgastrically in someone that's had a gastric bypass, you do not see the same rise in the glucose the same subsequent drop in glucose, the same rise in insulin as you do see uh, with someone taking it orally. At the end of the day, this is primarily a gut-driven disease, reduction in carbohydrates, strategies to reduce emptying are probably the best therapy rather than doing pancreatectomy in these patients. I thank you very much for your attention. I apologize for going over.